All right, well, uh, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, please welcome Dr. Benjamin Sobacool. Uh, he's a professor of energy policy at the University of Sussex, where he also directs the Sussex Energy Group and Center on Innovation and Energy Demand. Uh, most importantly uh, for you all, he is the solvency advocate of one of the affirmatives that can't be, put, be putting out uh, about water and uh, electricity. Um, so we're excited for his input on this, this year's topic. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to, to him. Thanks, Kurt. Can you enable me to share? I put together a, a small presentation for everyone. You're all set. Thank you. So uh, it, it's a pleasure. I have to admit, I, I'm a little, not antagonistic, but a, a little ambivalent about presenting to Michigan because you always used to beat us because uh, we were also in your district. But I also remember I was telling Kurt when I was a debater, these sorts of meetings were so helpful to me as a debater. So when I saw the invitation, I felt it was my civic responsibility to do something uh, because I benefited from probably 20 or 30 of these in my career, because we would also invite experts from different topics to help discuss the resolution. Um, for my first one was the Civil Rights Act of 1964, way back in 1997. So that's also why I like doing this, because uh, I know it can really help benefit you. So I wanted to help talk to you today about my area of expertise, which is not water. It is more energy and climate. But as you'll see you know, in today's presentation, um, the linkages are quite compelling and quite surprising. So I'm kind of, I've set up a kind of background deep dive into the topic, and then I've, I've given a few very recent estimations to some of the work we've done in the past year that kind of update some of it. So I'll start here. This is a diagram that you can use. I know you don't always debate with diagrams, but this is from the Department of Energy, so it's free for everyone to use. Federal government stuff always has no copyright. And this was their attempt in a report two decades ago to visualize the electricity water nexus. And you can see all the ways in which you see the blue arrows are the water flows and all the ways in which the red arrows are energy flows. And you can kind of get a sense for, we like to use the word socio-technical system uh, in academia, because it, it really encompasses multiple sectors, multiple dimensions, multiple actors. You have hydroelectricity producers, you have mining operators, you have households, you have wastewater treatment facilities, electricity generators, electric utilities, uh, you have transmissions and systems operators, you even have cities, uh, and you have others who are doing things like manage nuclear reactors. I'll share this reference later at the end. This is a chapter that I did uh, for a handbook two years ago, uh, compellingly called the Energy Water Nexus. And in the left is when I put it together, I always use Microsoft Word and there's a navigate function that lets you see the outline. And I quite like it because it really offers a more analytical structure to the diagram that I just showed. So you can see, the energy water nexus is about water and energy production. So this is all the way at the kind of top end of the supply chain, things like coal mines, things like uranium mines, oil and gas wells, they use incredible amounts of energy. They're commingled. You also see energy supply. Uh, and this is things like not just uh, electricity, but also things like constructing power plants. You may be surprised sometimes reactor components are so big you have to float them on barges. So there's interesting connections to water supply water availability, navigation, and handling things like huge equipment. Also connections to things like fly ash and waste. Another dimension is this nexus of energy and water pollution. And the two big things here are air pollution. This is acid rain, NOx and SOx, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, things like mercury, uh, things like PCPs, persistent organic pollutants, also endocrine disrupting pollutants are all involved with energy because we use lots of toxic materials. And then climate change, uh, of which energy is, depending on how you count it, maybe the biggest contributor. And climate change is aggravating water scarcity and water insecurity. Uh, and so you could roughly make a linkage that way and that the ways we produce energy are creating the future water crises of the world. And then finally, you have this framing of externalities, which is kind of what are the impacts? Uh, and this is also quite neat because you can directly trace linkages between energy and water consumption and things like water crises, droughts, what's called subsidence, which is where you deplete water too quickly and it causes earthquakes or landslides and collapses buildings. Agriculture, very compelling linkages. Agriculture and energy compete in most countries to be the single biggest user of water. Uh, so a scarcity in one can affect the other. You can have uh, agricultural water consumption contribute to energy crises 
and you can have energy crises create crises of food production because there's not enough water to go around. And you also have linkages to public health and even to things like aquaculture and fisheries. So that's kind of a very high level, like that is the energy water nexus at four very different dimensions, extraction, production, supply, pollution, and then this kind of cascading realm of, of impacts. And I thought it would help you, this is from a report we did, just to kind of underscore how big the linkages are. So you can see some of these numbers, you know, power plants in China pump 34 million gallons of water a minute. So in the minute I've been talking to you, right, three minutes, there's been 100 million gallons of water that have gone into power plants. Um, U.S. water use for power plants is now at about, well, now it's 20 years ago, 71 trillion gallons. This is like a Great Lakes worth of water. Um, and also in France, a few years back when they had these heat waves, they had to shut down nuclear plants because they didn't have enough water. So water scarcity can cause aggravated energy scarcity. I'll just do this really quickly because you probably will get into the dynamics later if you bother running cases that deal with cooling cycles. But part of the reason that energy uses so much water is that we usually burn things to produce electricity. Nuclear reactors and coal-fired power plants are really complicated ways of boiling water, believe it or not. Nuclear power is a complicated steamer. <laughs> it's just producing a lot of steam. And if you drive by power plants at night you can, or, or in the cold, you can see these huge vapors coming out of their cooling towers because they're venting a lot of that steam. That means the cooling cycle for a lot of these power plants will directly relate to its water footprint. And there are very, very different cooling cycles. We did a report for Richmond's Law Review four or five years ago, so it's still fairly up to date that talks about these four cooling cycles. And I'll just give you a brief overview. Once through cooling is the majority of what we use, like 90% of our power plant, most of our, our reactors, but it, it is what it implies. Water goes through and that's it. It's released back to the river or the lake or the ocean. Uh, and that also means that this is a very key thing. It's talking about energy with water withdrawals rather than water consumption. So water withdrawals where you withdraw water from a source, it goes through your cooling cycle and it returns to the source. Consumption is where you take water from a source and it leaves the water table. It doesn't go back, whether it's from evaporation or you can capture it and recirculate it, which is the second type, which withdraw less water, but because they're recirculating it and they're raising its temperature, they consume more. So there's already this tension between water withdrawals and water consumption, and they usually treat it with chemicals as well. So they withdraw less water, but the water that they do end up using is not really water anymore. It may have a lot of, of, or, uh, of different chemical treatments, which means it's not drinkable or potable. Then you have dry cooling systems, which have almost no water requirements, but they have really nefarious impacts on power plant efficiency. And they usually are used only out west where it's drier. Um, and so again, you're starting to see these tensions. You can save water potentially, but that's gonna cascade and have negative effects on power plant efficiency, which then means prices, reliability, blackouts, tariffs. And very recently people have experimented with, with hybrid cooling because it gives you that flexibility to switch between maybe once through recirculating or dry, but these are the newest. They're the most flexible, but they're also the most expensive because you basically have to install twice as many cooling systems so you can switch back and forth. It'd be like having two cars in the garage instead of one, which is great, but you've got to be able to afford the price of the, of the two cars. These numbers are still mostly up to date. This just shows you uh, the proliferation of power plants uh, and their cooling cycles and the size of the bubbles, the size of the plant. It's from the EIA, which is a great source. The EIA is part of the US Department of Energy. It's the Energy Information Administration, and it is it and the International Energy Agency are where a lot of us go for data. So it's reliable for the most part. And you can see uh, lots of once through freshwater systems, uh, as well as saltwater systems on the coast, and then this proliferation of new closed hybrid systems that are just starting to emerge. Although you can see the bubbles are a little bit smaller. This helps show you, again, it's a little out of date, but um, the fleet of power plants that's using water, it's nuclear and coal that are the most water intensive. Gas is intermediately moderately intensive, both because it's not using thermal temperatures as high as nuclear and coal. Also, their capacity factors are lower. And that means that natural gas plants are what's called peaking plants. They don't provide electricity all the time. So they're only on a quarter of the time. I think the average capacity factor 
for a gas plant's like 25%. So three quarters of the time, it's just sitting there waiting to be used, which then means, of course, it's, it's water consumption is not as high because you're not using that asset. It's like a car in the garage that has fuel in it, but it's not turned on. So it's able to conserve its fuel. I was quite surprised as well that one of the interesting things uh, you probably know already because you're doing work on water is how frequently droughts come, even in the US. Uh, and these droughts used to be quite severe, like when the settlers were colonizing the United States, they had to face droughts. And this just shows you, um, you know, this was just within your generation, this is like eight years ago, in 2012, how the, in the single day, there were 3,200 high temperature records set because of, of climate change and extreme or exceptional droughts, even in the South, even in the Midwest. And of course, perhaps, because you would expect them in places like Texas or Arizona uh, or New Mexico or, or near Nevada. So because of this kind of precipitance of drought, it does create pretty interesting risks uh, to energy supply because it's so water intensive. And this shows you that I think almost every county in the US with a very few exceptions like Maine and some of those in the South have had an extreme drought you know, over a hundred year period. And many of them have had droughts up to 10% of the time. So they're very, very frequent. And that also means that you have water shortages. Uh, and these shortages are of course, correlated to things like population and energy supply. And what you can also see is many of those red areas are major population centers. Also look, some of those red areas are near you in Michigan, or at least near the Northern Great Lakes, places like Chicago, like Detroit, like Cleveland as well as places like Miami, you can see Houston, you can see Las Vegas, you can see uh, other kind of population centers. And that's why largely um, US water use is so intimately connected to energy and intimately connected to drought. And I'm still amazed, and this by the way, shows you the difference in definitions between consumption and withdrawals, which I mentioned earlier. So when people start to say water use, they're usually combining the two, but it can mean very different things. But what I quite find shocking about this is um, it's a little bit hard to see here, but those, those cross hatches in white is thermoelectric utility. That's a fancy word of saying energy. It's the biggest single source of water use in the US. So we use more water to make energy than we use for livestock, irrigation, agriculture, or drinking water. Uh, and you can also see it here, just how big it is. Um, in terms of the left. So red, right, 47% of water withdrawals in the US come from power plants. And on the right, um, you can see it's, it's um, mining uses a lot in irrigation. Irrigation uses a lot more consumption, but energy uses a lot more withdrawals. And this also shows you, again, just putting in different water uses overall by industry, how big overall water use is. Remember, use is consumption plus withdrawals. Uh, it, it, it's not even close, right? It's, it's close to what is that 50%, whereas irrigation is like 32%. And I like this as well. This is just an analogy and we use it in one of our books, I think, that you use more water related to the energy use in your home than you do your water use. So if you add up all the home water use, gardening, drinking, laundry, washing, and showers, it's here on the right in terms of gallons per day. It's not insignificant, right? What is that? 75 gallons a day for the typical household use. And yet the equivalent amount of water we needed for the energy in your home to run the appliances and the TV, look at that, it's what, 300 gallons. So it is a magnitude of order, more water is related to our energy use in the home than our water use in the home. Final thing that's quite interesting, and it relates to those cooling cycles I mentioned, because they're even the once through ones are taking water from a source goes into a power plant and then it goes back to the river or ocean, they change the temperature, which makes sense because power plants are hot. And that's the whole point of the water, right? It's a cooling agent. So it goes into the turbines, into the cooling cycle, and it's basically a, a, a thermal transfer of heat from the energy conversion process gets put into the water. And that means you can use these thermal scans. These are thermal scans of two nuclear power plants. And it just shows you how hot, it's not boiling hot, but the water is significantly warmer. And that also means that our energy infrastructure creates water pollution. It can hurt fish, it can hurt animals, it can cause eutrophication, which is like increased rates of growth for, for algae. Um, there's even a term for this, which is called the water delta. <laughs> delta means change in temperature. And the EPA 
tracks these as part of our environmental statutes, because things like the Endangered Species Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, and some of the air pollution acts all require you to maintain appropriate temperature changes so you don't basically toxify watersheds. And this is from a National Academies report, I think, that shows you that like we have a whole fleet of power plants that are failing their inspections all the time. As in, they're not supposed to have deltas that are more than 25 degrees, and yet they do. And you can see them all over the place, Montana, Ohio, Kentucky, Mississippi. Look, there's one, J.H. Campbell, Lake Michigan, right? Uh, there's another one, Edgewater, Lake Michigan. And there's one that's fairly close, well, kind of Ohio River. Um, and that's not good, because that also means that it's not water pollution per se, but it is certainly water impacts that then create environmental destruction and toxicity. And I think, um, if you are talking, I mentioned this earlier, but this is a graph that shows you the different way. In terms of water intensity of energy supply, this is a different way of looking at it. So per unit of electricity production, what uses the most water? This is your answer. So nuclear, coal, bioenergy, and gas are water intensive. Energy efficiency, wind, solar, and some geothermal is not water intensive. So if you were to substitute the ones on the left with the ones on the right, you would accrue significant water savings per kilowatt hour. And kilowatt hour is a small unit of measurement. Kilowatt hour is what like you use in a room of your house. A home will use uh, typically 900 kilowatt hours a month. So you can multiply it out already. And a neighborhood will use megawatt hours. And a city will use gigawatt hours. And a state will use terawatt hours. So it goes up and up and up in, in orders of 1,000. So these numbers get massive. Like the US will produce trillions of kilowatt hours per year. So you can multiply that 40 number by trillions and you start to get a sense for how much water is associated with energy production. Those impacts that I mentioned are more chronic. So they're kind of happening even with the safe operation of energy infrastructure, even those temperature deltas, it's like everything as usual, business is normal, everything is malfunctioning. But we also know that energy systems don't always work that way. So another way in which they can pollute water is by catastrophic accidents not chronic releases due to normal operation, but catastrophes. Uh, and you can probably remember some of these in your lifetime. We have Fukushima, right, which was caused by water. It was a tsunami. It was a wave, raced in, hurt the Daiichi nuclear reactors and the spent fuel storage facilities and raced out. And there's still radioactive pollution leaking from Fukushima. And on the right, um, it's uh, Deepwater Horizon, which helped pollute huge swaths of uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And these accidents are more significant than you may know. These were major accidents that cost hundreds of billions of dollars, but we've done assessments that have found many other accidents as well, right? So look at this, 20 million and 430 million gallons of oil are spilled every year in the States. We have all these oil pipeline spills every week uh, or pipeline spills, right? Or a single pipeline like the Trans-Alaska pipeline has had 642 spills in my lifetime because I was born in the late 70s, all of which would have impacts on, on water. And I'll, I'll show you the reference for this later. We did a nice assessment of 100 years worth of energy accidents from 1907 to 2007, and essentially find that they all fail in different ways. So the most frequent one to fail is natural gas pipelines. That's about a third of the total. Now it fails, it's very low intensity, maybe causes explosions. The most expensive to fail are nuclear reactors because they just cost so much. They account for uh, only 23% of the number of accidents, but like 95% of the costs. And hydroelectric dams, when they fail, look at this, 1% of the total, but 99% of the fatalities. Because when a dam fails, it's like massive floods and tsunamis that kill people. So what's interesting, all three of those types of accidents, gas pipeline collapses, uh, reactor accidents, and hydroelectric dam failures involve water. And you can actually project frequency counts, probabilistic risk assessment to give you good numbers for how much these impacts would happen. And these are chronic impacts. They're systemic. They occur every day, every week, over and over and over again. So they may add up to more damage than the types of catastrophic accidents that we see with Fukushima or with um, things like uh, Deepwater Horizon. Final way of looking at it is this term externalities. Uh, and this is a term that you may have come across before. Some of you may not know it. It's a term from economics. It refers to any cost involved in consumption of a product or a marketplace transaction, any cost that isn't paid by the consumer. 
So a, a great example of an external cost is, you know, the cholesterol you get from a McDonald's hamburger, creating a healthcare burden 30 years later, or the risk you get to lung cancer from smoking tobacco cigarettes. Those are externalities because the true cost of that behavior isn't on you, it's on the healthcare system, it's on taxpayers, et cetera. And energy systems have a whole host of externalities. We did a meta-analysis, which is like a big scale review this year in 2021, of externalities with energy and transport. Uh, and this was quite a sophisticated study. It took us about two years. Uh, it's better than all the other studies because with meta-analyses, it's about the evidence you collect, how many studies you include. I think we included something like 800 different estimations of externalities, whereas the previous state of the art was like 100. So we're like, for lack of a better term, eight times as good as what the state of the art was. And lucky for you, we did this study before Kurt ever contacted me water is one of the externalities we tracked it's here it's wa um and you can see that we tracked it across these different parts of the energy supply chain raw materials electricity supply transport um and we monetize those impacts as well because the evidence is telling you in terms of uh damages per kilowatt hour damages per cubic meter gamma damages per you know uh, what is it uh you know cubic kilometer of water you can start to do other assessments that calculate out how damaging it is. So in the article, and it's from 2021, you can actually calculate here with these numbers from the evidence, from those 800 estimations that we had, all of those, 19 of them involved water for energy and 12 involved water for transport, although I realize transport isn't directly germane. And you can see the median, the mean, the max, et cetera, in terms of damages, so this tells you the way to read this is let's find the mean 2.32232. So 2.3 cents is lost in terms of water damage. Or to put it another way, electricity systems cause 2.3 cents per kilowatt hour of damage to water systems. And again, you can multiply out the number of kilowatt hours the US produced, it's going to be in the trillions of kilowatt hours. Uh, and that will give you a nice estimate of the hundreds of millions of dollars of damages that water is doing. Now, as horrific as that may sound, water is, uh, it's this yellow color on the top graph. So you can see it's like the fourth from the bottom. It's not very big. <laughs> I mean, it's big in terms of, wow, it's millions of dollars of damages, but it is not nearly as big as air pollution or climate change, which dwarf the impacts of water. Uh, you can also see here that land deforestation and even aesthetic issues like concerns over mountaintops or property values are all more significant than water. So in the grand scheme of things, water isn't the biggest externality. But for your purposes, you can still at least calculate out how much energy systems are causing water damage in a fairly rigorous way. Final thing we've done, and this is the last part of my, of my talk, is we were invited to do a law review for the University of Richmond. That's why I have this Vermont Law School logo at the bottom right, because uh, that's where I did most of my energy nexus water work. It wasn't where I am now, so I figured I should attribute it to Vermont Law School. And one of the things that we had to do, um, you may not know this, but if you do go on to law school, and I know many debaters do, it's really good to do law reviews. And the way law reviews work, it's almost like a debate team. Law reviews are usually a team of authors, as well as a faculty advisor, and then a team of people learning to who are getting their Juris Doctorate, learning to do a law review. So it's like a team of 10 people. So law reviews are quite rigorous. This is why we always used to do a lot of evidence from law reviews. So we were invited to do a law review for University of Richmond about solutions to the energy water nexus. And these were our six solutions, which may be relevant for you. Better data, better water intensity, ban water intensive energy sources, really aggressively push energy efficiency and renewables, uh, and then finally, uh, reprice externalities, reprice energy or water. You can do it either way to better account for some of these damages. So I'll go over each of these quickly before we, we end and open it up for questions. So the first is how bad data is. So I said earlier that the EIA is like one of the premier sources of data on energy, and that's true. It is better than most. Like if you compare the EIA to China or India or even the UK, it's pretty good. But their water data, because they're an energy administration organization, their water data is usually self-reported. 
uh, and it's not very good. So when we were starting to comb through the data, you can see like up to 31% of what we tried to collect wasn't even there, or it was misreported, or there were errors where it should have been like a thousand and they reported a million. So there are errors in transcription and errors in tabulation. You also have water mentioned in some pretty good legislation like the EPACT of 2005, but it doesn't do anything more than that. So it's kind of toothless legal regulations. I already talked about this as well earlier a bit. You can also reduce water intensity by these alternate cooling systems, whether you retrofit, how much it costs, and whether you can use other sources of water like brackish water or wastewater in power plants is also quite interesting. There's also this nexus of desalination, which we talked through, as well as new designs, because all of the things I talked about with cooling cycles would be retrofitting. But for your building new power plants, you can design them with state-of-the-art cooling cycles. So there could be an opportunity there uh, to create better synergies. Third thing is a moratorium on water-intensive electricity or energy sources in areas of water stress. Now, we did a fantastic study. I did this at Virginia Tech with geographers where we use GIS. GIS is like a fancy way of making maps. And we did quite sophisticated predictions of three things. The first thing we tracked was population growth. Because pop, you, know, you may be surprised, we're moving out west. No one goes to Michigan or Ohio anymore. We're going to Arizona. Phoenix, I think, is the fastest growing city in the state. So we have a significant migration of people from colder places to places like Florida or the southeast, southwest. So population growth. We mapped population growth out to like 2025. Second thing we mapped out were uh, power plant additions. Where are we expecting, maybe because of population growth, uh, we have to build new power supply. And there's a lot of those places as well, because as population grows and cities grow and industry tries to scale up, they have significant energy needs. The third thing we did is we, we also projected what's called the summer water deficit. Summer water deficit is the amount of water you think you won't have during the three hottest months of the summer. And you can usually measure that in terms of inches of precipitation or trillions of gallons of water. And we did these maps. We overlaid the first map of population, where is it most intense? Then the second one of energy supply additions, which is most intense. And the third one of water deficit, which is most intense. And the areas in red are the areas where you had all three happen at the same time. And we called these in the study, electricity, water, crisis areas. And they don't seem so big here until you realize that like half of the US population, something like that, is in these areas. It is San Francisco, Las Vegas, Houston, Dallas, and I'm going to get Chicago, uh, Atlanta, uh, New York, right? So it's like, oh, <laughs> it's all of our major urban areas. And it got to be so severe that we even, in one of our law review articles, you can read it, uh, we actually proposed an executive order. And we did it easy on the president. It was, I think, President uh, Bush at the time. Uh, we even drafted it for him. So all he would have had to have do is sign it. He didn't sign it. But there's at least language there in that law review article about the executive order. And also, if you still run counter plans, why the executive order counter plan is better than uh, congressional action or state by state action. Um, but more to the point, that executive order proposed a moratorium. Let's not build water intensive energy systems in these red areas because we're creating a quagmire for ourselves. We're creating a future nightmare that will all but guarantee either water shortages or energy shortages. And that comes to one of our solutions. Remember that graph I showed a little bit earlier about water intensity of energy supply and some of the energy systems that don't use that much energy that use water. Now here's the rub. All energy systems use water to some degree. Even solar panels, which don't have a cooling cycle, use water. How? Water from manufacturing, water associated with construction, and you have a small amount of water for maintenance because those things get dusty sometimes, you have to wash them off. So it's only like a few gallons per year, but it adds up, right? If you have millions and millions of solar panels, that ends up being millions and millions of gallons of water. So even solar and wind use a bit of water, but they use like a thousandth of, the, of less water than things like nuclear. And energy efficiency saves, it's really neat, saves not only water, but energy. Power plants are built to match supply and demand, but with reserve margins. And so most of our power grids have a 15 to 20% reserve margin where we have power plants that are what are called idling or running spinning reserves. And in New England, 
which is where I was when we did this study, it was 17%. So our power grid isn't providing 100% of our energy, it's 117% because you have that 17% reserve margin in case something happens, in case a new factory comes online or a power plant goes down. That means energy efficiency doesn't displace a one-to-one -one ratio. Every kilowatt hour that you displace with one kilowatt hour of energy efficiency displaces 1.17 of actual energy supply because it's displacing the reserve margin. So as one of my colleagues was like, used to say, energy efficiency is like the free lunch you get paid to eat because it's displacing even more than a one-to-one -one relationship with it, which means it's fantastic at displacing water use as well. You can do both with what's called demand-side management or energy efficiency efforts. And they're all very good at basically saving energy or providing energy with very minimal water needs. And they can also usually operate in droughts as well, whereas your thermoelectric power plants can. We did want to suggest that you change prices. Uh, and this is quite interesting. Many of our power plants still don't pay for the water they use. It's either a public use or it's free or we guess. So we don't use volumetric water pricing. And electricity prices don't actually reflect water use. So it's like a double negligence. Water systems aren't pricing power supply and electricity prices aren't capturing water embodied in the kilowatt hours that they produce. Um, and so, yeah, you could do some of these things like time of use rates for both electricity and water would revolutionize overnight, potentially, how we use water in, in the sector. So yeah, uh, as we concluded in that all law review article, our power plant supply still remains dependent on these thermoelectric sources of energy. These are fancy ways of saying power plants that burn stuff. Here's the, here's the rub, even low carbon sources, some of them are thermoelectric, nuclear, hydro, um, bioenergy, geothermal. They're still using steam. So they're still water intensive. And you have people arguing for a nuclear renaissance. Well, that could just lock us into 50 years more of water intensity. We also think back to my slide earlier, the complexity of the energy water nexus. It's not just what I've been talking about in terms of electricity supply, it's energy extraction, it's mining, it's navigation, it's pollution and all those externalities ranging from health, right? To subsidence, um, to, to agriculture. And unfortunately, or fortunately for you, we have a whole variety of tools that we can use to fight this problem. Executive orders, better cooling plant cycles, energy efficiency, wind and, and solar. So you can manage the problem, but it will require some pretty far reaching changes. To help point you towards future reading, this, this is all of the studies we've done on uh, energy and water or that I mentioned today. So this first one is the energy accident study that I mentioned that talks about the 100 years of accidents. The energy law journal one, the energy policy one and the Columbia law journal one are the three that use the GIS and the mapping of energy water crisis areas, as well as the drafting of the executive order. I think it's in the Columbian Journal of Environmental Law. I didn't talk about these two. We have a piece looking at Brazil, so a little less relevant for you, but it's how you can actually protect rainforests as a way of displacing water treatment. So in other words, rainforests are quite good at treating water. They're actually far more effective and far more efficient than a water treatment plant, and they use virtually no electricity. And so this was a neat way of using what's called ecosystem valuation or uh, protected areas around an urban area, which is Sao Paulo, to do a better job of maintaining water, water purity and water quality than treatment facilities. And then another one I didn't talk about was the use of information. We have this thing in the US called the TRI, the Toxics Release Inventory. And that is a way of, of actually reporting on uh, toxic so sources of pollution and toxic discharges, including oil spills, but also things like cadmium, lead, mercury. That's also a neat way of controlling pollution. So if you're really interested in pollution, you could read this thing on the TRI, uh, which is basically informational governance, using informational systems to help reduce unwanted externalities. Then we have some things I didn't talk about. We did a special report with the Center for Naval Analysis. I know we get to work with some of the coolest people, looking at energy water crises in four areas. It was uh, France, India, China, and lo and behold, Texas, which just had an energy crisis a few months ago, ERCOT, the Electric, Re Electric Reliability Council of Texas. Um, and you can see that here. That's these things led by Paul Faith. I used to kind of say you got to have faith. 
uh, where we look at how to conserve water and mitigate emissions with state-of-the-art tools. And the Naval Center did some nice projections as well to talk about um, kind of what the technical dynamics. And we did a law review as well for NYU called Troubled Waters that was also talking about the findings from the report. And then the final two things I've got here, the energy water nexus chapter that I started my talk on is here. It's got a 2020 date, so it's more recent. And then the most recent externality study is just two months old, and that's at the bottom. That's the one where we gave you the numbers about quantifying the externalities. And with that, I think I've only gone over by two minutes. So Kurt, I'm very happy to stop presenting and to turn it back uh, to you and the debaters. All right, well, uh, thank you very much. It's very interesting. Uh, folks have questions, please type them into the, the Q&A box. Um, in the, the chat, I've also shared uh, some of the articles uh, or book chapters uh, that, that were referenced. Uh, I think everything that was presented, you'll have access to through the UMesh library, um, and that should be turned down for you. All right. All right, so we've got two questions already. Uh, the first asks, why would you choose to advocate for an executive order rather than going through Congress? Yeah, great question. Um, I will admit my debate training had a little bit here. I was kind of like, let's just try the XO uh, and wrote an article about it. But to be more substantive in my reply, at that time, and I suspect it's still the case now, bipartisan legislation that's progressive on energy is very difficult. Uh, and I remember the joke of the Energy Policy Act 2005 was it was the no lobbyist left behind bill. It was like there was something for everyone, clean coal, hydrogen, nuclear. And it was, you know, we've done assessments that was like, what was the impact of the Energy Policy Act? And it was like they had no impact because it was basically running in circles. It was giving incentives to increase coal production. At the same time, it was giving incentives for people to do energy efficiency. It was increasing the ability of wind to substitute for peaking, but also promoting natural gas peaking. So it was kind of like it wasn't strategy. It was just a mismatch of different things that appeased different interests that kind of paralyzed us and didn't really progress in any single way. Um, and I think that's true with congressional legislation. In reality, you get all these add ons, you get everything watered down. And we had had a very negative experience. If, if some of you have been in debate a long time, one of the things that I argued for 15 years ago, and it was big in debate, was a national RPS. It's a renewable portfolio standard. Uh, and at the time, we were really close. Like we were average, we wrote a report for the network for new energy choices. And we spent a month, I spent a month in DC with my colleague, Chris Cooper, who's also a former debater from Wake Forest, uh, lobbying Congress. We, I, I met congressional speakers. I met people from the House and people from the Senate. Um, and it failed by one vote. <laughs> so it was like a month of my life was wasted trying to convince all of these people at the end. The national RPS statute, which is back in like 2008, was stripped out at a, at a conference because the House bill didn't agree with the Senate bill. So it was like all the way to the end. We were like, had the champagne in the fridge. We're ready to celebrate the national RPS. And we were like, oh, it got taken out. So that also was just like, OK, I think an XO is the way to go because it obviates all of that complexity. And it could literally be done tomorrow. It's instantaneous. And the way that we imagine fiat works in debate that's what an EXO actually could be. Um, so that's that's really why. Oh, no. See, uh, portal skills right there. Um, Matthew asks, what are the reasons to favor a ban on these industries rather than forcing internalization of externalities uh, to incentivize only polluting if the benefits outweigh the cost? Very good, good answer. Um, there's two kind of reactions. The first is that if you were to price them, it would probably price them out of the market. So you would end up the same place anyway, right? These things after two or three years wouldn't exist because everyone would have shifted to other things, but it's kind of a brutal way of doing it. Uh, whereas it's much easier to force technology, force these new technologies in, uh, which is the way we've typically done it, like with sulfur air amendments in 1992, right? We gave some flexibility to power plant providers, but we forced them to lower their emissions. We didn't just say, oh, kind of do it at your own kind of voluntary goodwill. Um, my guess is that if you were to do some of those changes, I said price water or have energy prices include water or charge electric utilities for the water they use, you could triple, quadruple, sextuple the price of energy. So it, it would, it would, and who's that gonna hurt? That's gonna hurt low income families. It's gonna hurt industry. It's gonna hurt small and medium enterprises and energy intensive industry in the US is key to jobs. It's things like steel making, paper and pulp, meat processing, right? These are things we need and we don't wanna import them from China. 
So they're also a little probably politically unsalient. So I think it's a bit softer to kind of say, and notice we didn't say ban existing. We said ban new thermoelectric capacity additions. Um, the other thing is a kind of way of thinking about it is, and this is the same thing with what's called a feed-in tariff, which helps promote renewables, is you still have to pay for it even though you get the benefits. So even though that has all these co-benefits, you still have to get them implemented. And so it's like you spend, you still have to spend like $2 billion to get the $8 billion in health and water benefits. And so they're not no cost. They still have a cost. It's just the cost-benefit ratio works to the positive. So that's the other reaction is that even though they have all these net benefits, you still have to invest in them to then secure the net benefits. Uh, Armand has a, it's two questions. Uh, the first is, what do you think the least bad form of energy production is? So I'm guessing Armand is uh, hinting more at fossil fuels than solar and wind. The truth there, and we've said this a lot, is energy efficiency first. For some of the reasons I mentioned earlier, and there's even good stuff like the IEA has it like the first fuel. The first fuel is the megawatt. So there's megawatts with an M and there's megawatts with an N, which is basically a displaced megawatt because the cheapest power plant is the one you don't have to build. And I didn't have them in my talk, but there are these phenomenal graphs that show you the biggest single source of energy in the US over the past 40 years is energy efficiency. It's all the things we've done, corporate fuel economy standards, energy audits, uh, certificates, uh, the Energy Star rating scheme, uh, and a whole variety of other measures. Those together have saved more energy than any source of coal or nuclear or renewable or wind. And it's not even just true for the US, it's also true for all of the countries in the OECD. OECD is the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. So all of the rich countries, Germany, France, the UK, Japan, South Korea, it holds true. So really like that energy efficiency is by far uh, the solution. But if you don't have that within the scope of what you can do, and by the way, some states like Vermont have energy efficiency utilities where they actually do work like a conventional utility and make money selling energy efficiency services. Uh, but if you aren't able to do those, maybe because you have a monopoly market or it's not within the scope of debate, um, the evidence is quite clear. In the externalities study that we did, the two worst energy sources, the two energy sources that had the most damage in terms of social cost were coal and waste, waste to energy. You have a class of intermediate ones in the middle, gas, hydroelectricity, nuclear, and then you had those at the bottom, which were by far the best. And it was actually very close to the ones that are water saving as well, wind, solar, geothermal, uh, small scale biogas, small scale micro hydro. So those ones tend to be the least worst. If you have to use fossil fuels, it's easy, it's gas. Gas always beats coal and oil over and over again because it has minimal externalities. But I still uh, think it's energy efficiency. Then Armand also asks, uh, I think trying to figure out how to topically write uh, plan text. Uh, do you think the federal government could increase water protections to incentivize nuclear energy? I think if they were to increase water protections, it would disincentivize nuclear energy because all existing <laughs> nuclear reactors are water intensive by far. And it makes sense, right? Because the nuclear reaction is hotter and bigger. And also nuclear is on all the time, it's base load, which means that it's water consumption is continuous, unlike say gas, which only consumes a quarter of the year when, when, you're, when you're flipping it on. Um, yeah, so I think that any really significant protection of water would go against nuclear. If you're trying to find ways to do nuclear, you'd have to be very clever at some new prototype that uses, like I said, dry cooling or maybe I guess desalination or brackish water or uses some sort of funky thing, or you've got to go the SMR route, which is small modular reactors. There, they don't exist yet, but there's lots of hype over them. And you could find evidence, I'm sure from 2021, that's like they're right around the corner, even though they're not, <laughs> I'm sure you could find good cards that would say that they are. Um, and those SMRs can run in different fuel cycles that would potentially use less water. SMRs have been just around the corner for, for quite a while. Um, next question is in the uh, moratorium as a solution, why did you choose the three specific predictors in the study? Yeah, it was more, I mean, it's always a, a mix of what you can do. Um, we had talked to a guy called Thomas Goliath, who is kind of a water expert, and he suggested those metrics. The other thing that was quite neat is we could get data on them. So we had census data on population, 
EIA data on the uh, electricity additions, and it was USGS data, US Geological Survey data on the summer water deficit. So that's also why. And they just made a lot of sense. I mean, we could have used other metrics, but we kind of like those three. Right. Uh, Dana Randall asks um, that you, you mentioned that you could, or one could regulate emissions or water to achieve similar outcomes of motivating a more friendly energy sources. Uh, can you describe why one would focus on water instead of emissions or emissions instead of water? I mean, it depends. I know, yeah. Um, this is also a difference between climate policy and energy policy. Is the goal to reduce emissions of CO2 and that gives you a certain set of options or is the goal to promote energy security, jobs, diversification, which give you a whole other set of options and they don't always align. Same with water and energy. You can promote things like nuclear, which are very water intensive, but that creates water crises, et cetera. So there are lots of these kind of, of pesky trade-offs. If you, I think really realistically, if you were to have the water system change its prices and start charging energy suppliers for their use, you've probably got two problems. One is it's just such a huge volume of energy. Energy, I'm guess, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm guessing that water is very much like energy and you have what's called reverse block pricing or descending block rate pricing. Descending block rate pricing means when you consume energy, the more you consume, the cheaper it is. And this is why if you look, you can look this up, the residential price of electricity in the US, the average price that we pay is something like 12 cents per kilowatt hour, but the industrial price is like seven. So it's like five cents lower. It's the same electricity, right? A kilowatt hour is a kilowatt hour an electron is an electron, but it's like 40% cheaper. And that's because of course, industry matters and we want to attract industry. And it's also because they're consuming in bulk. Um, so that means there's a huge incentive for a lot of these firms to consume just a little more energy, even if they don't need it, to get into the next tariff bracket that is cheaper. And if the same is true for water, it's the same problem. The more water they consume, the cheaper it is. So when you start to ironically have these, co these companies consume less water, they may jump backwards in some of their tariff schemes, if they even have tariffs. That's the first challenge. Second challenge is I'm guessing that a lot of the power plants don't actually use water from a water provider. They're using it from a river or they're using it from a stream or an ocean, so it's not priced. And I don't know what you do about that, because if you start pricing power plants to use the water, then what about agriculture, and irrigation, and, and other forms? So you're kind of the slippery slope, but you could do it. I mean, you could, in the world of debate, think about doing it that way. I think it's probably far more likely that you do it the other way, because it would make sense and have energy utilities and suppliers have a water incentive or a, a extra water tariff maybe, like one or two cents per kilowatt hour, could go towards water conservation. You could tweak tariffs that way to help offset. Um, we already do that in the States. Uh, there are lots of things called systems benefits charges where you put surcharges on the price of electricity to achieve a social goal like weatherization or emissions trading or training for employees, right? Or improvement of air sheds. So we already have these things. Uh, and you could add a water statute there, but I'm guessing that's a little bit easier to do. It's more elegant and the energy companies know exactly how much water they're using, where the water companies do not know how much energy necessarily is being produced at the power plant. Probably doesn't help you for the, your debate case, but it seems the logic to me would be energy is the better way to regulate water. Sounds, um, so outside of the, the research that, that you presented and we'll share, um, links to, to the students uh, based off that. Uh, do you have any suggestions for other areas for background research uh, when looking uh, at the water topic from an energy perspective? So Kurt, what, to remind me, what is the resolution? I know I think you emailed it to me. Uh, it, you, have, you have it memorized yet. Uh, the United States federal government should substantially increase its protection of water resources in the US. Okay. Water resources. And what is how? What's the definition of a water resource? I believe that it is uh, not uh, not fully defined, uh, or there's not one definition. So it could be public drinking water, it could be aquifers, it could be lakes, rivers, streams, yep. the ocean. Uh, with uh, we've been operating, or some of us have been operating under the assumption that's within the EEZ. Still, so you have a whole host of evidence now on ocean protection, marine protected areas, 
which would be good background reading. And then you have uh, a very, very, so you've also got ocean mining, but that probably is going the other way and would hurt, you could ban it. Because um, people, so yeah, that's the first area that's quite neat. Minerals. We need a lot of minerals and materials for a lot of our products, cobalt, lithium, graphite, rare earths, and many of them are found in the ocean. Many of them may also be found on the continental shelf, like methane hydrates. Uh, and so there are plans to like basically, for lack of a better term, strip mine the ocean. So if you were to prevent the strip mining of the ocean, you would be able to protect a very, very nice energy resource and or a very nice natural resource. And the projections are actually quite interesting. I've done some of these, like the material projections for things like decarbonization. This is like EVs are, are crazy. So here's just one example. Um, in the year 2015, we had 1 million battery electric vehicles on the road, 1 million. By the year 2040, it needs to be a billion. <laughs> a thousand million, it's gonna go from one to a thousand in our lifetime. Think of all that crap we have to build. Where are we gonna get the lithium? Where are we gonna get the cobalt? Where are we gonna get the copper? So people have even started to talk about mining the moon, mining in space, right? So because of that mineral scarcity and mineral security, and there's also this huge fear of the Chinese, uh, mineral, rights and critical materials security is a very hot topic and you could potentially people are are talking about basically going to the oceans or offshore for that the other thing that comes to mind um is interventions that also what's called promote net zero or negative emissions or greenhouse gas removal or carbon dioxide removal this is basically using the water the ocean as a sink of for carbon dioxide uh, and you can do things like ocean alkalinization, ocean fertilization, you can do deep water injection, enhanced weathering, but it's a whole host of these very new options that do involve water uh, and basically try to enhance the capacity of our water systems to store CO2 to help solve the climate crisis. Some of them are good for water, like blue carbon is one, where you're basically building more seagrass. And that's a way that both purifies water and stores carbon. That could be a potential area. Others are quite bad, like stratospheric aerosol injection, marine cloud brightening, or cirrus cloud thinning, which are basically sprinkling sulfur into clouds. Some of them um, can have both positive and negative effects, uh, not just negative. And so here's an example. In Australia, they're using stratospheric aerosol injection right now to help save the Great Barrier Reef because they're helping lower immediate temperature of water. So again, these the weird nexuses between these very high-tech things like stratospheric aerosol injection and, and water, which could be pretty far out and pretty creative and would enable you to either ban the things that you don't want or find synergies of where you're protecting water and sinking emissions at the same time, which gets you a lot of the climate change benefits. The geoengineering perspective there was very interesting. And that's something uh, that I've thought about at least. You know, there is a third. Um, Ah, there, it was this, uh, I can't believe I'm going to forget this. There was, and this could fit. I think we ran this case once a long time ago, but it's a special type of sonar the Navy was developing that was so active, it actually like killed marine animals. So it's like a way of detecting ultra quiet diesel submarines that like North Korea and Syria were developing. The problem is, is it hurts marine biodiversity. Uh, and so I'm not sure if that, affects water resources so much, but it's kind of a cool little one that you could ban the use of this sonar, which had a very special name, which I'm forgetting now. That's also uh, one of the, the issues that this topic presents is the state's counterplan. Uh, and obviously the, the DOD uh, gets around that, that pretty well. So yeah, uh, something, something worth um, investigating. Uh, speaking of which, this is probably our last question. Yeah. Uh, what are the impacts of interstate conflicts over water usage for energy? Uh, for example, tri-state water disputes. Um, and do you see them becoming more prevalent in the future uh, as water consumption by power plants increases? Yes. So I don't know a lot about water conflicts, of course. I did not study that. Uh, and, and I also, I know much more about the interstate regulation of energy than I do for water. I do know that things like the Supremacy Clause and the Dormant Commerce Clause come into play and give the federal government a lot of authority for energy. I'm not sure if water is, is the same. Um, but the one thing I can tell you, many electric utilities operate interstate just because of 
their ability to pool resources, or it's the way the grid is structured, or it's because they're investor owned, right? Or especially for renewables, as you integrate renewables into your portfolio, you need more space. So it's really hard on a utility if they've got one wind farm in Idaho. It's moderately difficult if they've got 10 wind farms in Idaho and North Dakota. It is really good for them if they have wind farms in Montana, North Dakota, Idaho, and a few more states. So kind of the bigger you get, the more interstate you get, the easier it is for that utility to hedge assets, to better balance supply and demand, uh, to basically run a more efficient grid. So in that regard, I, you, I guarantee you that there are huge interstate consortiums at play uh, in the realm of energy. And whether they map on very well to water, I'm not sure. The, my guess is you'd have very different actors. The actors involved in interstate electricity conflicts would be the utilities, civil society, uh, and FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. The actors involved in water disputes would probably be what the USDA, the EPA, civil society groups, fishers and farmers. So you've, you've also got kind of different layers, but um, it is a very interstate issue. And I'm guessing the way that you design electricity grids is similar to how you've designed water distribution networks in the US. And so it is probably something to explore more, but I don't know anything else about it. All right. Um, well, thank you uh, very much for your, for your time. Uh, we, we appreciate it. Um, and we appreciate you for being a prolific author uh, who, who might have debate in the back of their mind uh, while writing. So. Yeah, yeah, that's always the case. And, and debate is really my the skill that enabled me to do that. So I think, you know, I encourage all of you all to write, you know, you can do it as debaters, write op eds, write policy briefs and blogs and all that. So, well, well, thank you very much. And hope you have a nice evening. You too, Kurt.